What is a typical uh, real estate AIF investment? There are about 12 lakh investors in India. What is the tier 2 story like? You can never be so different from the industry. What has the performance of AIFs in uh, real estate? One has to invest a uh, minimum of 5% or 5 crore whichever is high. Uh, balance between managing this risk, what are the different levels of risk that you see? Funding for land at large has not uh scaled up this is something you built in house of the 10.8 lakh crore approximately 20% is the commitment for real estate the investment size is is fairly large that's 10 lakh crores but the number of investors in aifs is only 10000 yeah. great service to the nation in uh taking it to the 30 trillion dollar economy yeah. So hi uh, Ram welcome to the Property Angel podcast and thank you for joining us here today you've come all the way from Mumbai so thank you for uh, spending this uh, time with us uh, you've of course been a very prominent figure in the entire alternative space uh, in India you know earlier as the CEO of Edelweiss the real estate practice and now with Integro and in that period of time the entire AIF industry has seen phenomenal growth You know, in fact, when I was doing my research for this podcast, I was uh, shocked to understand that the uh, investment size was ten lakh crores. Yeah. And if you compare point. that, yeah, if you compare that to the mutual fund, uh, that is fifty lakh crores. So I thought twenty yeah. percent was a pretty large yeah. uh, sort of, uh, you know, a percentage. Um, and the majority of this has been in category two, which is where uh, you know you operate. So I thought if we could start with you just giving us the basics of AIF and helping us understand what are the three different uh, categories. So uh category 2 is where the private credit play happens. Okay. Uh category 3 is more equity hmm. uh and category 1 is more of social investing. Uh in India close to about 85% of AIFs operate in the category 2. total size as we speak uh, of commitment uh, to aifs put together is somewhere at about 11 lakh crore 11 lakh crores okay of this 11 lakh crore 4.29 lakh crore has already been raised okay uh, and invested okay uh, of the 10.8 lakh crore approximately 20% is the commitment for real estate category 2 aifs uh which is somewhere at about 2.2 lakh crore okay of which 80000 crore is already raised in cash okay and roughly 76000 crore is already invested and this 76000 crore is invested through close to about 250 odd schemes uh which are launched by various players in the space i see and what about category 1 uh category 1 we have actually not followed very closely because it's more the social impact investing okay um and that amount has been very very low and but isn't that also where the vc is and uh, so yeah i mean that's as good as a mirror to what you do in angel investing as individual okay uh angel to series a okay uh, that's where lot of play is there but that's not something that we have really followed from the real estate perspective okay because okay. we are far from that space where equity investments the real equity investments at corporate level or brand level will happen in indian uh, okay. real estate space okay okay what is a typical uh, real estate aif invest in direct developers or or how does that work so you can look at uh, real estate aifs in two parts okay uh, the part one is which is residential working capital okay which is where about 75 to 80% of the money has been raised okay and invested okay uh, these monies are invested at the project level for uh, specific working capital requirements of the project okay um uh, in india still the f- funding for land at large has not uh, scaled up uh, that it should have of course given so many reasons uh, for practices and governance uh, and things like that 
बट मोस्ट ऑफ दिस मनी रिटायर्स बाय सेल्स ऑफ यूनिट्स बाय इट सेल्फ सो द लिक्विडेशन इज थ्रू द सेल्स इट सेल्फ एंड द इंटरेस्ट ऑफ इन्वेस्टर्स इन दिस स्कीम्स इज टू अर्न द ईल्ड plus some amount of income which gets multiplied over a period of time okay yeah okay so now let's say that when you're putting money into these uh, projects right through the developers of the projects uh, what are the options they have they can come to an aif what are their other options to raise capital so <clears throat> see there are three four options and i think this is where one has to understand the equity stack of how indian real estate works okay so largely and historically the equity has been funded by the buyers hmm the yes. second stack is the nbfcs okay or the shadow banks the third one is the banks hmm and then there were private investors hmm aif is replacing those private investors okay and creating a much professional a better structured deal hmm and replacing that market hmm. this is what the idea was but what happened somewhere in 2017 and 18 after the nbfc crisis okay um, the industry realized that we are at a stage where it is very difficult to predict and project the timelines okay and banks and the nbfcs have to stick to the asset liability management very dearly hmm. and that's where they started developing the cold feet okay now okay. aifs are supposed to not only fill the gap for the private investors but also for the nbfcs and the banks okay so now the overall funding stack hmm. if you see is the developers equity hmm the aifs then comes the nbfcs and then the buyers and then the banks okay the difference is very simple if you understand a bank will fund a project uh where they do not fund for the land or the premiums and permissions hmm. their funding is secured and more predictable only once 10 to 20% of inventory is sold rates are established hmm. 10 to 20% of construction is done by mm. the equity of developer okay okay nbfcs are now not allowed to fund for the premiums and land anyway oh they are not they are not okay so where now the developers uh, option mm. is there for availing the funding is the aifs so without with uh, there not being any pre launch a sale option maybe that market also moved into the aifs is that why we have seen that Absolutely. level of growth absolutely okay and the other part is that uh, what i would call is the india's uh, second bliss after 1993 liberalization those 300 days hmm. between 8th november 2016 to uh, october of 2017 uh, there are three key events that happened demonetization okay. yeah rera hmm. and gst gst all three <laughs> and there yeah. is a fourth one on top of that okay. which of course may not be directly related yeah. to uh, you know the indian real estate but that's upi hmm yes right yeah. so these are four things which will change hmm. uh, the course of economy for next 10 to 15 years hmm. Hmm. Uh, so that's uh, yeah. in nutshell how things have changed and yeah. that's where uh you know from private investors hmm. burning their hands hmm. because of the lack of data and information and consistent management and uh, uh, understanding of performance from the developers the replacement hmm. uh happens to be real estate specific aif okay because okay. the expertise lies there hmm. the uh, rigor to follow to manage to understand the risk hmm. and monitor is lies there Hmm. which in case of a bank or a nbfc would not be possible because they have to be sector agnostic hmm okay okay so talking about that how do you uh, balance between managing this risk what are the different levels of risk that you see and balance between the risk management and uh, generating alpha for your customers i think the key risk in real estate lies in uh, the planning Hmm. if you look at today across 26 states 
there are about 96000 odd projects which are registered in rera okay of this close to about 30% projects are already in delay in delay as per okay. rera information okay okay now the cause of the delay can be attributed to two okay one is the faulty planning okay where you assume everything good will happen okay. from the developer side <laughs> and then let even the customers believe yeah the second is the lack of financial closure lack of financial closure closure okay. so most of the projects that you will see uh, they start hmm. with that confidence that the buyer will fund yeah the construction and completion yeah yeah and when the market changes hmm. or the situations in the market changes hmm. that's where then you start looking for an option hmm. Hmm. versus more established industry practice should be that you first close the project financially yeah. Yeah. and then let the buyer's equity give you the alpha hmm. 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 now what we do uh, at integro or okay. i think most of other aifs okay. would be doing is the risk is at three levels the first is the planning hmm. second is the certainty of the financial closure or completion of the project hmm. and third one is consistently monitoring okay. the discipline of following the cash flow that had been projected and predicted at the start of the project okay okay in our experience with the fact that we have already made couple of investments and also exited okay as of now i think the respect to follow the plan as far as cash flow is concerned and despite of a 15 day follow up monitoring releasing kpis is hardly seen at about 20 to 25% okay so that's the kind of lack of you know clarity and confidence in planning hmm. uh and that's why it is very difficult for banks and nbfcs to very soon find that confidence mm-hmm. in the industry to go and fund mm-hmm. so the what is the tier 2 story like so we are not investing as of now in tier 2 um, our uh, area of investment as of now is in six cities in okay. india okay okay uh, but i think uh, and we have been you know covering lot of tier 2 cities i think the economic dispersion in india has started since last about 3 4 years okay and most of the tier 2 cities uh, may surprise us in their growth story on the positive side okay uh, and the credit goes to the regulators and uh, the competitive spirit of local regulators now the city okay. planners yeah who are now looking at cities from the perspective of next 50 to 100 years and how they will evolve hmm so a combination of economic dispersion beyond the four or five cities hmm. Hmm. and the uh, you know competitive spirit of the regulators yeah. and city planners yeah. uh, across the tier 2 cities will usher in a growth for the tier 2 cities in a very different way So how come you are not investing in the tier 2 story? We are covering. You are covering. We are covering. I think it is a early stage. My sense is overall real estate itself is at a early stage. <laughs> and there is a lot to be done. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about that the opportunity, right? You said you're we are still at the very early stage in real estate and uh, so what is the opportunity that you see from here and why did you start into grow? So you know annually we are and i'm only talking from say residential perspective to start with and then we'll okay. cover commercial yeah. annually we sold last year about 4 and 1/2 lakh crore worth of inventory in real estate to deliver this inventory you can roughly say that close to about 1.2 million units or would hmm. be in offering hmm. over a period of next 3 and 1/2 to 4 years across okay. different stages okay this kind of supply yeah needs uh, a very uh, established form of funding on one side uh, and for that not just the aifs but aifs banks and nbfcs all three will have to step up Hmm. how we really because this will be the growth engine for the country's gdp 
where we want to reach from here. Yeah. So that's the first point. The second point is the total supply of grade A commercial hmm. is somewhere at about 700 million square foot in the country. Okay. In last 23 years. Okay. Next seven years, the hmm. total supply of graded commercial is equivalent to last 23 years. Wow. Okay. So, you know what kind of capital yeah. you need to, you know, usher that growth. Yeah. Uh, so, this is the opportunity. Now, how does this capital get, uh, you know, arranged for or where does it come from? So, if we look at AIF, because that's what we are talking thematically. Yeah. There are about 12 lakh investors in India who we consider as qualified investors. Okay. The HNIs uh, who have 5 crore and above investable surplus. Hmm. Of that, in entire AIF space, hmm. there are hardly 10,000 participants out okay. of 12 lakh. Okay. Of the 10,000, okay. there are only 2,000 odd investors hmm. who have participated in real estate AIF. Okay. Okay. If you compare that with the mutual fund, which hmm. is at about 45 lakh crore today, yeah. we have three and a half crore investors. Hmm. Right. Hmm. So, I think there is a lot of scope of right education, right processes and right governance. Hmm. both from the AIFs, the developers and also the government, hmm. which will ensure that the supply of capital, hmm. the availability of capital is there, but the education uh, and the protection of that capital is something that if industry can really uh, put forward hmm. uh, and put forward beyond the menial local issues of yeah. permissions and regulatory yeah. issues, and bring the customer on the center and mm. then look for the funding. Mm. Uh, I think the capital is enough. It will find its way to real estate through AIFs. Mm. But that's interesting that uh, while the investment size is, is fairly large, that's 10 lakh crores, but the number of investors in AIFs is only 10,000. Yeah. How do you explain uh, that? I think it is also to do with that uh, most of large size investors prefer investing directly. Okay. Um, and there are two sides to the story. One side of the story is that if you have size, you can afford to go and write a bigger check. But the other side of the story is if you get stuck, then the industry gets a bad name. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is where, uh, you know, we have been talking and engaging with a lot of family offices that real estate is a very specific area of expertise. Hmm. We need not 10, 20, 30, but we need maybe hundreds of franchises in India, oh. which are specifically building capacities and capabilities uh, to manage the real estate risks. Okay. Because it's not just one single rule uh, yeah. like a, a mutual fund or insurance. Yeah. Uh, it is every single locality, every single local corporation yeah. has a different rule. Exactly. And exactly. that's why you need yeah. such a massive scale yeah. of players. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, and so how many such AIF real estate funds would be there today? I think there are about, as I said, about 200, uh, 250 odd okay. uh, number of schemes. Yeah. And if you look at uh, uh, real estate AIF, the I would not say PT, but because that's what happens when the industry is at its early stage of evolution. Hmm. Uh, most of the asset managers, like the banks and the NBFCs, hmm. find real estate investing as an adjacent opportunity. Okay. And when you have an adjacent opportunity where you are only putting your 5 or 10% of, hmm. uh, you know, capital and focus, hmm. you hmm. will not develop the expertise. Hmm. 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 And then that's where we are trying to make a difference hmm. of building a real estate specific franchise okay. uh, so that we can manage that kind of a risk. Understood. And I think. That's what I said when I said we need at least 100 of such franchises yeah, yeah. across the country yeah, yeah. to manage and then to attract the capital. Yeah, yeah. So, and how would Integro's funds be different from the other players uh, or the other schemes available? I think 
Um, or how how does an investor pick amongst? Yeah, uh, I think, and and this I always speak about. You can never be so different from the industry. Okay. Uh, so as far as the product is concerned, it is like anybody else. But as far as the approach is concerned, as far as the institution capacities, the technology that we have built, hmm. uh, that is absolutely aligned to what is needed specifically in real estate. So f- just giving an example, we have this platform called as Arjob, which is the tech platform, which ensures that right from evaluation hmm. to capturing the essence of performances hmm. to managing a fortnightly KPI, which is more like a useful dashboard hmm. for the developer himself. Okay. Okay. To ensuring that the entire invoice processing okay. to processing of NOC for sales happens through the system. And that KPI every 15 days is not only helpful from the investor's perspective to the manage the risk and consistently predict the risk ahead of its time, mm-hmm. but it also helps the developer understand where he is. So all your developers use the same technology? Yes, they have to. They have to use it. They have to use it. And this is something you built in-house? We built in-house. Okay. Yes. Okay. So did you not find uh, some technology available that, uh, that you could use uh, for this purpose? I think it was... When, when we started looking at technology, there were hundreds of them. Okay. But each of them were solving a very different challenge, a very different problem. For solving the real estate challenge, okay. we had to build it. Okay. Yeah. So there is nothing like this available. So every AIF, I mean, would be uh, at least from a real estate perspective. Yeah, and, and that's what I was talking about. When you look at the industry, everybody has been looking at AIF as a normal general financial investment Hmm. either through a private credit or equity yeah Uh, but this is very different yeah and and that's That's where you need a very different approach to this yeah problem uh so aif funds i mean pretty much are close-ended right and then you have a fund life which is typically five to seven years years. So, so what does that mean? What happens at the end of the five to seven years? Does the fund have to be liquidated or what does yeah. that mean? So the fund scheme has to get closed, which basically okay. uh, essentially means that you will recover the entire money and pay it off to your investors through the trust that you have, uh, you know, okay. roped in those funds, either in form of dividend if it is a profit or return of capital. Okay. Uh, most funds uh, belong to two categories. Either they are giving some part of uh, income as dividend hmm. consistently hmm. and putting some amount that they keep reinvesting so that they can also give a effect of compounding at last. Yeah, yeah. And some funds have, uh, you know, the strategy of compounding everything. Okay. The difference is in how you think about tax. If you are doing a dividend plus compounding, hmm. uh, the dividend get taxed like yeah. a normal income. Yeah. If you are doing compounding entirely, then hmm. the entire money, the capital hmm. uh, is returned with a long-term capital. Long-term capital. Okay. Yeah. okay. So it, it depends on, you know, there are investors who look at uh, consistent regular income like hmm. fixed income. Hmm. And there are investors who look at, you know, a low tax yeah, but, that's true. Uh, a back ended. So you would have different funds set up with these yeah. uh, goals. Okay. Yes. Okay. Even at Interpro, yes. you have that habit yes. like that. All right. And how? What is the revenue model? What are your fees like? So the revenue model uh, simply is that you take a annual fee hmm. uh, on the asset under management, and then you have a, a upside the carry. So beyond a particular hurdle rate, yeah. Uh, whatever you make for the investors you pass on 80% to the investors and 20% is your upside. And uh, the the management fee on a, on annual basis? What is that is on annual basis. Yes. That is, what's the industry average? So industry average starts on a very aggressive level at 1.5%, goes up to 2.5%. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I've heard you mention before that uh, it's very important when you structure the fund to ensure that uh, the investment manager stays till the end 
the life of the fund the compensation should be structured accordingly yeah so what did you mean by that exactly and how do you solve for that at integro i think any investment when you make uh, the skin in the game yeah is uh, not only when you invest you get something but when you get the exit yeah. and uh, our strategy has always been that whoever is investing stays till the last exit so that his compensation and his upside hmm. is also linked to it hmm. the true fiduciary role and that's what we call ourselves a true blue fiduciary yeah. is when you think of the investor first yeah his yeah. exit his yeah. profit and then part of that comes to you yeah now yeah. at a company level it is fine but yeah. even at the level of uh, investment manager or the team which is managing that investment hmm, hmm, hmm. if they do not stay hmm. then there is that internal no matter how great the processes are but then there is that internal uh, you know shouldering on which goes on that the last team did this so why should we do that hmm, hmm, right hmm, hmm. that's why it is very very empirical and Im- important to keep the continuity of that team and link their upside and uh, give them the upside at the end of the day because you just can't keep them on a year to year basis employees yeah that's not a great culture to set up yeah that's true so uh, but the employee should also be vested into that right Absolutely. because from an industry standard it has to match because uh, that sort of ties them in yeah. to uh, yeah i mean uh, see it's it's all about Uh, what kind of culture you set if you are hmm. setting up a culture that you will give larger part of your profits hmm. to the employees yeah uh, and link that to the exit which is hmm. the real success hmm. 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 versus in the blind race of hmm. you know doubling and tripling your uh, aun hmm. uh, if you compromise and just get the get great of greatest of the deal makers they'll hmm. make the deal hmm. but then who manages it yeah that's yeah. true <laughs> yeah so talking about that like what has the performance of aifs in uh, real estate been uh, in the recent past yeah and uh, yeah so let me divide that performance in two okay parts <laughs> uh, performance till 2015 okay uh, because real estate aifs themselves came in uh real effect since 2014 and prior to that it was vc right hmm. uh that has been very bad okay uh most of the vc uh kind of funds invested in land they invested okay. at equity level with the developers okay burnt their hands okay and that's again the negativity that the industry carries hmm. post 2014 15 hmm. since the aif regulations became more and more prominent hmm. that's where now the clarity on who to invest how to invest and and sebi has really done a lot of work in terms of the standards of disclosure hmm. uh, globally hmm. uh, we are not far off hmm. we have one of the best uh, standards of disclosure today okay okay now most of the funds are performing in that range provided some fund goes and makes a mistake hmm. um between that 17% 16% to 22 23% on the private credit side okay yeah uh and how would you say this compares to the mutual funds reits pmss i think every time we talk about equity and real estate uh the only differentiation critical differentiation uh, differentiator is the the certainty hmm. the certainty of return and in a equity market is very different hmm. you have to go through the whole whirlwind yeah uh, there is lot of uh, dependency on how the market works hmm. in case of real estate investment hmm. that certainty is very very high hmm. that delta of return may be not more than 4 5% in a good market hmm. you may make let's say 23 24% hmm. net hmm. at the fund level in a bad market you will still make 15 16% hmm. Hmm. 
But in an equity market, can somebody stand and say that I'm very sure that this is how you'll do hmm. from a year to year perspective? Uh, not really. Hmm. Uh, so that's something that is the real differentiator. Hmm. So if somebody had to uh, compare between investing in a PMS and, uh, you know, in, in an EIF, how, how would they make that comparison? I think it's... It's very, these are two very different concepts. A AIF is a pool of capital in a trust, wherein a PMS is, uh, you know, the discretionary or non-discretionary choice of an investor to make that investment. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, the manager hmm. of that money only makes the fee. Yeah. Right, on that. Yeah. Uh, so these are two very different yeah. uh, concepts. Yeah. So when you are investing in an AIF, for example, you get units. Yeah. If you want to exit at a NAV, you can exit it. In PMS, it is your investment, your book. Yeah. And your portfolio manager is only advising you. Correct. But at the same time, it's the same corpus of money, right? That I can decide whether I want to put in a PMS or if I want to take that money to an EIF. And these are all HNIs that we are talking about. So how does that one decide whether which option is better for them? After all, I mean, everybody wants that capital appreciation and yeah. protection. So a lot of investors prefer investing in the NCDs directly okay. using the PMS route. Hmm. And... Uh, lot of investors or most of investors prefer going through AIF because there is an active investment management hmm. of the money hmm. and and it's part of a pool. Hmm. As a PMS in real estate, it's very difficult hmm. because in, in real estate, let's say you are underwriting even a small project, you will be giving 50 crores hmm. as size. Now, hmm. 50 crore coming from 50 people is not a very efficient structure. Yeah. That's why PMS is not very prevalent in that mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why AIF works more. Okay. But as a AIF, if you have invested through, let's say, NCDs, mm. you can certainly, using the PMS route, mm. give access to your investors to even participate in NCDs directly. Okay. Okay. So, uh, in terms of the regulatory environment, if you can just help us understand at the very basic level, what are the regulations under which AIFs operate? So, uh, the key regulation is uh, SEBI hmm. um, and for category 2 AIFs, all you need is a investment manager's fit and proper status. Okay. And then you need to file for the scheme. Uh, the scheme has to be fair with all the disclosures of risk uh, and SEBI assesses that and gives you a go ahead to then go and raise the money in the trust. Okay. Um, and the advantage of investing through a trust or AIF is that you have uh, certain tax benefits of long term. Okay. 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 Because it's a trust, you have yeah. a pass-through structure. I see. I see. Does the, the fund manager have to invest a certain amount of his own capital in any of the projects? Is that part so of So, as a sponsor, uh, one has to invest... Um, minimum of 5% or 5 crore, whichever is higher. I see. And and that's it in terms of the regulatory yeah. environment. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So and the basic uh, construct of AIF is that it is fiduciary. Hmm. 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 If you are managing your own money through AIF, then why do you need AIF? Yeah, true, true. AIF basically means that uh, you are managing third party investors money hmm. as a fiduciary. Hmm. And you stand last in the queue for your money that you have invested. Mm, got it. So that's the concept. Yeah, yeah. But how do they ensure that the fund manager has ample skin in the game? Um, I think uh, there are two parts to skin in the game. One is the asset manager's annual fee. Uh, second is the upside. And from a regulatory perspective, uh, SEBI has a very well-defined of, you know, filing, periodic filing of NAV and disclosures of the risks, hmm. disclosure of the investments that they have made, the okay. changes in the environment that have happened. Okay. So that ensures that investor is equally aware. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And have there been any changes or developments in this uh, regulatory environment? So SEBI keeps coming consistently looking at 
what's happening outside there in the market uh, so every regulation change that comes uh, comes to make the disclosure norms more and more stricter okay so that the instances of misselling hmm. and misreporting hmm. both are captured okay yeah. okay uh now before we close can you tell us a little bit more about your journey and uh, you know how you started uh, integro and a little bit more about uh, you know why real estate um uh, so my journey uh, for last about 4 years uh, and uh, my journey will never be complete without uh, my friend colleague uh, and partner mr ashish devra okay um his strategy or his vision uh, had always been that in india we cannot take real estate just as an opportunity hmm. um, while everybody the industry is so large that you just jump anywhere and there is a profit but can we really build an institution hmm. um so my journey is part of building that large institution where technology capital and governance hmm. three things are brought together to create the real play for next 10 to 15 years okay uh, so that's that's the kind of uh, you know uh, participation of mine in that journey so uh, the journey started with integro asset management and aurum proptech okay uh, aurum proptech's journey has been that can we really build serious technology play or digital play hmm. in every aspect of real estate hmm. experience for both for the developers for efficiency and for buyers for experience hmm. and also the investors for showcasing that one can manage risk hmm. so these are the three things hmm. and for that uh, both of us uh, have been consistently involved and engaged in how we can build a governance structure okay. where different set of entrepreneurs hmm. with diverse ideas and diverse problems that they are solving for hmm. the real estate can independently coexist and work with each other okay uh, so it's it's the aurum's large vision where yeah. integro is one part of it okay yeah. okay so you started integro about 3 uh, three many, and a half years 3 and a half years ago yes. and what is uh, the investment size that you currently manage so we have just uh, crossed 1060 crores of wow. au in residential yeah. okay we are closing our first commercial fund uh, possibly in the mid of april um, through which we will do close to about 4 and 1/2000 crore of commercial okay, okay. um if all goes well we may be launching our second series of uh, working capital okay. uh, fund in range of 1500 to 2000 crore uh, by august this year okay 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 and any last uh, any more any comments any advice for our uh, viewers or anyone looking to set up an ai fund <laughs> uh, i think and i have always believed that india is uh full of opportunities but with opportunities also comes the risk yeah and uh, my urge to most of the entrepreneurs in india is just don't invest to uh, capitalize on profit making yeah invest in uh, you know the purpose of profit hmm. that will give a very strong uh, governance structure uh, what we have lacked uh, historically is building strong governance led organizations yeah, yeah if we can do that and bring all participants of business starting from the customer the investor the society the governance the tax yeah. uh, and the employees hmm. if we can bring all these six uh, and then think about a governance we would really do a great service to the nation in uh, taking it to the 30 trillion dollar economy yeah, in next yeah, yeah, 35 yeah. 40 years Thank you so much for uh, joining us Ram that was Thank very you. insightful for me thank, thank you, you.
Hope you have been enjoying our podcast. At Property Angel, our mission is to make real estate affairs safe, simple and efficient. And that is why we bring you these podcasts to empower the consumer so you have the right information. We are an asset management company. You can outsource your landlord responsibilities to us, including tenant management aspects, maintenance, rent collection, financial management and all of that. If you have any such requirements, please do reach out to our team. Please do also like, share and subscribe. If there's anything specific you would like to listen to, please do leave it in the comment box below. Thank you for tuning in.